That's why, you know why Americans are so fat? <laughs> it's because they're hungry for connection. It's because in, their, in, in American suburbia, people don't even know their neighbors anymore. It's these, these lives are, are boxed in. And you don't know what's happening in the house next door. You can't hear them, you can't see them. All you see is a car pulling into the garage. The automatic garage door closes. Then the next morning, the car pulls out and they drive in their box to another box, their office cubicle. And you don't know, like, when I was living in a, such a neighborhood, you know, one of my neighbors got divorced. Nobody knew. All of a sudden, like, we just didn't see that woman anymore. <laughs> but in a, in, a, in a tribe or a village, everybody around you is so familiar. Like, this was unprecedented in the history of the earth. A group, a, a room full of people and you've never seen them before. In a 13th century village here in the Netherlands, like, you never saw a stranger. That would be like, you know, a really exciting, rare event. And maybe dangerous, you know? <laughs> like, it was, it was like, yeah. But everybody you knew knew you so intimately. And you knew them so intimately. And you knew their stories and their parents' stories and their grandparents' stories. And because you were known so well, you knew who you were, too. And the same, and, and with nature, too, you know? Every bird you saw, you knew what its song was. Every plant you saw, you knew what it would smell like if you, if you took it and, and, and smelled it and you knew what it was used for. And so we were embedded in, in a very rich story that included the story of who am I? Because we don't have that today, we feel disconnected and we have a loss of identity. So one in America, people will eat and eat and eat in order simply to tell themselves, I exist, I am connected. They eat to assuage this loneliness. Other people watch television um, and become involved in these stories and feel like they know the celebrities really well, you know? But of course, it's only a one way of knowing. The celebrities don't know them. Anything that, that pretends to meet a need but doesn't actually meet the need is addictive. And it's a great business opportunity because you can keep selling and selling and selling the substitute for the real need. So that's how to get rich in the old world. In the new world, the way to get rich is to step into your gifts. And this is a different way of thinking than we're accustomed to. Even a, a school child, you know, the school child maybe has some kind of talent Oh, you're, you know, this child can draw and paint really well. And the first thought of the career counselor at school is, okay, how can you monetize this? How can you sell this? When we sell our gifts, and I'm not saying not to accept money for things. I'll get to that in a minute. But when we do it for the money, then we're betraying the gift. It's like the artist who says, okay, what are the critics gonna like? You know, what's the market gonna like? Let me, let me draw for that. Uh, that's called being a sellout. But our gifts are meant for a sacred purpose. In fact, all gifts are sacred. And that's why when we give gifts, there's always a little ritual involved. But our gifts are, are meant for a sacred purpose. They're meant to and, and, and you, you have this desire, you know, to do things not just good enough, but to do it really well. To be able to, to look upon what you've created and say, yeah, that's really good. And often to do that goes against <laughs> what is economically rational. It's like the, and it can be in any field. It could be like the, the software engineer, you know, who wants to make his code really elegant. Well, why? Why should you spend that extra time to make it really satisfying and really good? There's lots of other projects online. There's going to be a pressure to get it done, to get it done fast, to make it good enough instead of good, good enough for the client. You get trained in school to make it good enough for the grade, but no better. If you're assigned a 10-page paper and you're really interested in it and you want to write 20 or 30 pages, that's crazy. You're already going to get an A, an a for only 10 pages. 
So we're trained to do things good enough instead of good. But it's unsatisfying that way. What we all desire is to do things in the most beautiful way we can. And to offer everything we do as a gift. It could be a gift to the world. It could be a gift to a specific person. In the gift economy that we're transitioning into, though, wealth will no longer come through having and through doing things good enough, but it will come through being an artist. An artist is somebody who does things in the most beautiful way possible, and who lives in the gift. And the world, in the world that is coming, we will all be artists. The best way to prepare, you know, people often ask me, like when I talk about economic collapse and stuff, people say, what's the best way to prepare for this? And a lot of people have in mind, you know, hoarding things. Well, maybe I should buy gold, you know, maybe I should stockpile things. The best way to prepare is to enter the gift economy right now to create bonds with other people and to accustom yourself to living in the spirit of the gift. It's, there's these really deep habits that, that you know, for, uh, there was a time in my life where I realized that every time that I met somebody, I'd have this little calculation, okay, what can I get out of this person? It's called networking. And a lot of it's happening here at Picnic, you know, where if, if, if you run into somebody and, and first you kind of fill each other out, okay, is this person going to possibly be of any benefit to me? Is it going to be useful for me to know this person? Am I going to make good connections to this person? If so, okay, now let me make him like me. That is so unsatisfying now. And I noticed that I had this mentality in myself. I only really started to become rich not, as I don't have, I don't mean rich in money, but rich in my experience of the world. When I approached each interaction with, okay, what am I called upon to give in this situation? And it's not that I refuse to receive. The counterpart of fully giving is fully receiving. It's like, how can I help? Yeah, what am I called upon to do? What do and, and, and because our default state is gratitude, the way to touch on this, what am I called upon to give, is well, what do I want to give? And ignoring the can I afford it, little habitual voice, but what am I called upon to give in this situation? When we enter the gift world, then we become rich like the people in Mali. And the truth of the old self of the separate self, which is more for me is less for you, is no longer true. What becomes true is more for you is more for me, too. If we're linked in a circle, even if you don't give right back to me, if I give, if you get your, your good fortune, if you have more than you need and you give it instead of keeping and hoarding it, but you give it, and then that person gives it, and that person gives it, and if we're in a gift circle, your good fortune is also my good fortune. So the challenge in the coming time is to, is to live in the gift in, in a modern world where we don't live in a society of 300 or 500 people like a hunter-gatherer tribe did, but we live in a society of, of you know, millions of people. How to rebuild the culture of the gift in this world. And this is gonna take centuries, I believe, to fully move into the gift. But it is the future, and it's something that we can start today and the experience of abundance begins almost instantaneously when you enter the gift. You may not have, and, 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 and so basically it's not your job to figure out how you're gonna receive. It's simply your job to say yes when you do receive, which is scary. It's scary to fully receive because we're afraid that we're going to be obligated then. 